Good evening, friends, and welcome to another Commonly Axed Questions. Today's question is various versions of do you char or burn your axe handles, do you recommend it, etc., and so on. I do not, and I'm not likely to start. Today I'm going to tell you why, and we're going to look at this problem mostly through the lenses of primitive technology, bow making and bows, and the ways that wood fails under stress. So first off, I don't have a strong yay or nay opinion about what you or anyone else does with their axe handle. You just do what you want. I'm just telling you what I do and why. In preparation for this video, I kind of did a YouTube search and just scanned. I, did, I didn't watch any of them, I don't think, but I just scanned through what was available. And I didn't really see any kind of like dissenting or contrary opinions on the subject. It just seems to be a pretty popular practice. So this is probably going to be pretty different than uh, anything else out there. I'm sure there are dissenting opinions probably on, you know, forums and comments where I just uh, I am not and stay away from. So I think of carbonized wood as compromised wood, you know, char charred wood is compromised in a certain way. I've done a lot of what uh, is commonly called primitive technology and especially like in my 20s. I actually wrote uh, primitive technologist on my tax forms and doctor's forms and everything for probably close to two decades. So I have a lot of experience uh, with that stuff and that kind of informs me about this particular subject. A very, very fundamental skill in primitive technology is straightening or bending wood. Some wood needs to be bent, like if you're making a hoop or you're recurving the ends of a bow. Other things like shafts, spears, atlatl darts, arrows, uh, hand drills need to be straightened. And in order to do that, we often use heat because it makes the wood really pliable and plastic. You bend it into the shape, let it cool that way, and often it will stay somewhat or a lot that way, depending. So if no one teaches you otherwise, and even if they do teach you otherwise, you will quickly find out that if you scorch an arrow shaft when you're heating it to straighten it, it will break more easily in the scorched area. I'm not talking about black scorched, charcoal, nothing like that. I'm talking about toasted brown. Arrow shafts require to be straightened while they're dry because if they're green and wet, they're probably just gonna migrate back to that shape again. So you're heating dry wood near a fire. If you scorch the wood and turn it brown, it's gonna be more brittle. It's easy to do. I've done it a lot. Everyone's done it a lot that does this stuff. It's a thing. All right, let's start moving to the chalkboard a little bit to look at bows. Why? Because bows are an excellent model of wood under extreme stress, often operating right near the edge of failure. So in order for a bow to do its work without failing, it has to be very resilient to stress. So often these things are thought of in terms of strength, but strength is kind of a sloppy concept because it, strength depends on what kind of stresses are applied. Under the umbrella of resilience, strength is a very important uh, concept and factor, but it's not the total resistance to the stress and the total adapt well, the total resilience is the right word to the stresses that the bow undergoes. And I've already discussed the importance of resilience and axe handles in this video, and there'll be a clickable link at the end of this video so you can watch that. So some bows are recurved at the tips. That means that these tips are bent up like that. These curves are not natural, they're put there on purpose. There are different ways to put those curves in. You can do it while the wood is green, you can soak it, you can steam it, but sometimes it is put in while the wood is dry, just by heating the wood over a fire. When the wood gets hot, it becomes elastic, you can bend it, and then it'll kind of hopefully set that way. I'm gonna cut in a picture of my friend Jay Sliwa, primitive technologist, in my front yard, recurving the tips of a U-bow over a hot bed of coals. Uh, it probably took him, I would say, an hour, possibly more, to recurve both ends of that bow because it takes a long time to get that heat thoroughly soaked in and hot enough to do the work without scorching the wood. If you just stick the thing in the fire, like a raging fire, it's gonna heat up really quick, but you're gonna burn the bow. I think if you were to survey the literature or look at everything that's out there, you would probably find a lot of recommendations not to scorch the bow and no recommendations to scorch the bow. Now here's something interesting. In primitive technology, we do actually use charring on purpose to shape, harden, and make more durable a piece of wood. So this is a digging stick. The usual way to make a digging stick once you get the stick cut is to stick the end in the fire and burn it. How many people have not, like everyone has done that? You stick a stick in the fire because it's fun, you're poking it around, it burns on the end, and you've probably noticed it burns to kind of a pointed shape. So you take this burned charred end, you rub it on a piece of sandstone or something to sharpen it, and you have your point 
and this point is more durable, it's harder. You do this also with spears, right? So if you want to shape the end of a spear, then you grind it sharp and it's harder, it's more resistant to like, you know, stick an animal with or a person or whatever you're doing with your spear. And that is a form of resiliency, right? It's resiliency to stress, but what stress, okay? This is resiliency to the stress of digging, digging in the ground, hitting rocks, you know, hit throwing a spear, hitting an animal rib. Maybe you're gonna like, punch the edge of the rib and it's going to keep going through and stick the animal and you're going to have dinner. But it's not resiliency to bending stress. The stresses that a bow is undergoing or the surface of an axe handle that's under flexion are very different than those. Now of course that would beg the question of is that useful in an axe handle? For instance, you commonly have what people call overstrikes where the handle hits like a piece of wood that you're splitting or it hits a limb that you're splitting and becomes damaged. Would that hardening help resist that. Um, I can't really say personally. It's hard for me to believe that that's more of a useful uh, thing when you're actually also compromising the wood fibers at the same time relative to not charring it and, you know, retaining that flexibility. And there's another solution to that, which is, you know, wraps and collars and braces. Now let's say we draw our bow. We're pulling the bow like this. This wood right here is under compression it's being crushed. If anything, the fibers of the wood are being smashed down and made shorter, if that's possible. Now on the outside of the bow, what's called the back of the bow, the wood is under extreme tension. So it's being pulled, it's being stretched, the fibers are stretched. You could think of the center of the bow, like the center line of the bow is maybe not being under that much stress, I don't really know, but the belly and the outside are under pretty extreme stress. And the further you get toward the belly, the further you get toward the outside, the more stress there is culminating essentially in the outside back of the bow being under the highest pulling tension stress. Now if you could study this a lot, I think you would find in both axe handles and in bows that the wood fails from the surface. So the failure initiates in a weak point under high stress near, the, near or at, probably at the surface of the wood, and then it suddenly runs down. So you're pulling your bow, you're pulling your bow, you're like, I can just pull that a little further, I can pull that a little further, and suddenly it fails, there's no warning, it just snaps, but that crack is going to initiate, in almost all cases, most cases, I don't know, probably all the time, mostly at least, in the outside of the wood, and then it's going to run down like this really fast. Because think about this, right? The further you go towards the back of the bow, the higher the stress on the fibers plus the back of the bow in all likelihood, unless you just took a tree, you peeled the bark off and the back of your bow is just up right under the bark and you didn't touch it with a knife or anything like that. Chances are that you've worked this bow and the grain is violated. So think of a bow or any piece of wood as just a bunch of fibers together like this, right? And they run you know, through the limb and hopefully they're fairly continuous. But if you do any shaping on the back at all, you're starting to kind of cut through those fibers and stuff. It's like if you're splitting wood, you're hitting it on the top and it busts the fibers apart, right? So think of it that way. It's like you're splitting wood and it, that failure is going to initiate between say like two fibers and then pop. Now this can be due to design, like certain designs will make stress higher in some areas. Poor tillering, which means like the bow doesn't bend really evenly and you might have a spot that bends really easy or a really stiff spot. And if there's a stiff spot, then it's going to be weaker on both sides because the bow limb is going to do more work right on either side of the, the stiff spot. So it could be like a little nick or a knot or a wormhole or just some little swirly weak spot in the grain combined with a high stress area of the bow limb and pop, it breaks. So here's another interesting thing about bows. This is a sinew backed bow. So this bow has a layer of animal tendons glued on to the surface, just like fiberglass. So essentially it's like fiberglass. You'll find this on a lot of Western bows, especially, and a lot of those bows are very short. Imagine you're riding a horse at full speed, trying to shoot a buffalo with both hands free while you're just holding on with your legs. Okay, imagine that. Do you want a five foot bow when you're doing that? No, you want a bow this small or smaller, just the smaller, the better. So the problem is when you make really small bows, they often come under really high stresses because the, the longer limb can kind of spread the workout over more length or more wood. Uh, the plateau, the plains, uh, California, you find bows with sinew backing a lot and they're quite short. 
Now, if there's a single good reason to back a bow with sinew or rawhide or other materials, it is to keep the bow from initiating a wood failure from the back, just like I was talking about, right? So what happens if I draw this and it starts to get near this failure? There's that weak spot, that place where the stress is stacked up. The sinew is basically just gonna keep that from lifting. It's gonna keep it from happening. It's just gonna hold it. If you watch my video on making rawhide ax handle braces, you know, like a collar up near the neck, I talk about how one of the functions of that is compression. It's compressing the wood fiber and holding it together so those cracks can't actually start to initiate. And this just reinforces this idea that wood fails from the outside surface. So getting back to axes, I mean, obviously an ax is in a bow and they're not completely analogous, but I think a bow provides this kind of uh, look at that, the failure of wood using the rule of extremes. And I think that the failure of ax handles is, is kind of essentially the same. It's wood under very high you know, tension stress, in a very high stress area, there's some kind of you know, chink in the armor that allows the ax to break. Now on an ax, this could be where the grain is cut through and violated in a strong way, like at, the sh at a shoulder or something like that. And in an ax handle, like in a bow, you can avoid a lot of the important um, violation of the grain. Uh, like on the belly, it doesn't really matter as much, but on the back, it's real important, but you can avoid some of that. In an axe handle, it's kind of like there's just violation almost everywhere, especially in a curved axe handle. So you've got a lot of chinks in the armor and potential places where stress can stack up and blow out. So weak points in an axe might be where the grain is, is heavily violated and cut across really quickly, like at a sharp shoulder or something like that. It could be where stress is just stacked up from the design. You can check out my video on you know axe handle resiliency again to see how the design can stack up high stress in certain areas of the handle. There could also be, you know, a flaw. So it could be, again, a nick, a knot, a wormhole, just some swirly grain or something like that. Now, I think it's important for us all to keep in mind that theory versus real life is often a very difficult, you know, tangle of string to unwind and sort out. I might be missing something entirely, some information I don't have, something I haven't thought of. We make our decisions based on information and experience and thinking those things through. Those are limited and so are we. We're just not that smart. Uh, maybe that hardened shell on the outside of the axe handle serves some good purpose and keeps the axe handle from breaking. I don't know. Given the information that I have and my personal experience of charring wood and then finding it to be very brittle and breaking very easily, it's going to be hard to convince me to take a torch to the outside of my axe handle and compromise the wood there in terms of its resiliency to stretch and tension for essentially what? What good reason? I so far have no good reason to do it and I have plenty of reasons that seem to indicate that I shouldn't do it. Now the primary reason people char axe handles as far as I can tell so far is essentially aesthetic, you know, because I like the way it looks. I like the way charred wood looks. In fact, I've been encouraging people to char wood for probably over 20, yeah, a really long time, over 20 years. I've taught it and I used to do a paints and decorations class where we'd have people char wood and then burnish it and it looks really cool, like high gloss black, very cool. I literally just built a whole wall for like a YouTube studio corner to shoot videos in the wintertime with like this. So this is charred and then brushed and burnished and uh, I'll tell you about that some other time. I like charred wood, it's great. This wood though is under no stress. Another question I've occasionally been asked is how do you make an axe handle look old or used? And my only answer to that is use it, right? Imagine that. Pick one or two axes, do the axe cordwood challenge and your axe handles will look used. If I were to do something to my axe handles to make them look used, like I use them a lot, I think I would feel like I was the tool in the equation. In my creed, in my ethos, that patina should be earned. You know, it's sweat, it's dirt, it's tree sapped, rubbed over and over with calloused hands. And that's something of an accomplishment and uh, something to be proud of. So check out this video I keep talking about, about axe handle resiliency, design, failure, and all that stuff, super cool. And check out this video down here if you wanna know what I actually do with my axe handles, which is essentially get a bunch of linseed oil in there. You can put a drop of water on top of that. It will just sit there and evaporate without soaking in. Very cool. Check it out.